Uh, so today we are going to go over a few basics on the key pillars of product strategy. And I'm Gokul Nair. I work as the principal product manager at Ariaka Networks. And prior to joining Ariaka, I was with Cisco Systems. And also I did my MBA from IAM Bangalore. So moving on to the agenda for the day. Today we are going to touch base on a lot of important aspects related to product management. So the idea of this session is to provide you with a thought process as to how to approach any product management problem. It could be a problem that you face in your real life as a product manager, or it could be maybe an interview scenario for you, right? So whichever way, this is just a direction uh, that I would like to share based on my experience. And you would see quite a few concepts we are talking about. But believe me, none of them is going to be theoretical. So no theoretical steps here. Just from a practical perspective, how would you approach a problem? So we will understand how you should be looking at a market or a competitive analysis to understand the viability of getting into a market. Once you get into the market, how you identify your business strategy, how you identify your customer per sort excuse me, your customer persona and define the value proposition for your product. And that's core to the positioning of the product that you are building. And once you have the product, you want to validate it. You want to build a product roadmap. You need to have the pricing. You need to have a route to market. You need to have the promotion offerings and more importantly, understand uh, what other actions are happening on your competitor's side or in the market in general to keep as an iterative, keep your strategy very iterative in nature. So this is at a very high level, the framework that we will go over. But in order to make it interesting, I'm going to use a hypothetical case study, uh, very, I mean, tuned for the purpose of this session today. Okay, so let's start over the case study. So I'm sure probably all of you would be familiar with at least 50% of the logos out there in the slide. Can you take a moment to let me know what is common as you see across all of these six logos? Just a moment, not too much of time. You can share your inputs in the chat. Yes, Agastya is right, right sharing. Excellent. So yes, all of them are ride sharing apps. And these are apps which have built a platform primarily connecting the riders and the drivers. Obviously, they are solving the problem of commute by providing compelling options against public transport. And typically, they are focused in cities where your internet connectivity is uh, in an appreciated fashion. And more importantly, none of these owns a fleet of vehicles. So that's the most important uh, piece about this business model. So it's a less capex model. You don't have to buy your cars, but you are effectively providing a very compelling alternatives to the traditional taxis of the world. Okay, so now you know what is common, but the question is what is different between these logos? Please chime in with your thoughts in the chat window. What is different between these different logos? Or at least between a couple of them, if you can identify. Excellent, excellent. I think, yeah, we are getting very close to what we are looking for in the session. So if you look deeper into the use case and the customer persona that an Uber targets versus what a Scoop targets is very different. The business strategy of Uber versus Lyft is again very different. 
I mean, the target mark, market that Lyft operates is very different from that of Ola. And because of all these factors, the product features are different, the pricing model is different, and even route to market could be different. So today we are going to go over a case study related to ride sharing apps. And this is a hypothetical case study. And I want all of you to be thinking as a PM, probably let's take the case that you are a PM in Google and you are in the year 2017. So maybe two to three years back, the market would have been different. You may not see a lot of the logos that you have seen in the earlier slide here. So we are trying to go through a simulation of a product management thinking process as to how and why they would have gone about creating some of these uh, big companies or promising organizations out there in the world. So for the time being, let's assume the world is dominated by Uber, Lyft, and Ola. And you are looking as a PM for an additional opportunity in the right share space. And you are intending to build a product which should be covering a global market, or at least for the simplicity's sake, let's say, let's take both US and India. And you want to continue to maintain the fact that you want to minimize your upfront investment or the capex and no fleet ownership is what, what is you are looking for. And primarily the most important goal for you is you want to acquire the largest number of customers. So you're not looking for a niche where like you get five customers. You're looking for a very large number of customer acquisition. And you know, the market is already dominated by these existing players. So what could be some of the ideas that you can think about to get into a similar value prop as what this Google PM is looking for? Many of you might think, okay, bike rentals. That's a very viable business. But what would be the caveats with regard to going down bike rentals if you are a PM and whose uh, mindset is sort of gated by the four criteria what I mentioned here? Okay, so in the interest of time, definitely uh, the fleet ownership is a difference. And more importantly, another piece is the applicability of US and India market. You do not have, I mean, of course the India market is heavy with two wheelers as a very common mode of transport. Whereas if you look at US, it's not that uh, common market by itself. I mean, common mode of transport, it's a niche. So when I'm, when my goal is to acquire the largest number of customers, Yes, what I'm looking at is not a bike market because there I'm limited. So the next option is, would you propose to create another Uber or an Ola or a Lyft? You have to, I mean, if you go back to your theoretical frameworks before you enter into any market, what would you do? You would do probably a Porter's five force, five force analysis, right? Of course, I'm not going to talk the theoretical frameworks today, but the the, the common sense of a PM would tell you, go and look at the market. Is the market attractive for me to get into? Of course, if you do some studies, you can see uh, this market is very attractive in nature. It's growing at about a 20 percentage CAGR. Of course, it's a 2018 to 2025 data. Um, and most importantly, you can see that this report says the Asia Oceania is like a leading ride share market, primarily because of the high population and lower ownership uh, from a vehicle perspective among the people. So there is a high potential for ride sharing market in this region. So the primary thing, your primary concern is solved. Yes, there is an attractive market out there. But the second thing is, what's your barrier to entry here in this market? Or how does your competition looking like? Of course, you know, you are looking at formidable ven uh, vendors like Uber and Lyft who have got billions in funding, who have sort of like established this market 
or, or entrench themselves into this market over the last three or four years. But the most interesting thing is, look at this side. They're making billions in revenue, but are they making profits? No, they're all red. So this implies you're looking at a market which is very attractive from a high revenue perspective, but heavy loss, right? It's not easy to make a profitable business compare, um, if you look at the model of an Uber or a Lyft. So heavy loss implies what? High cost of operations, right? You're, you're making a lot of revenue, but you are still at loss primarily because your cost of operations is very high. So what to do? Now, you, you know you need to get into this market, but anything you try to do, you have the existing strong players, very strong players with a very concentrated market share. Uh, would you like to continue or would you like to exit? And the second piece is, you are about to build a product which is global in nature. And it's very important for you to understand what goes in to make a global product. And an example of that could be looking at how Uber behaved when they bear in US versus when they launched themselves in India. And a couple of differences I have called out here. One, look at the drivers of Uber. In US, anyone with a driving license and a car can be your driver. So there will be many who are a Uber driver as a part-time, probably as a second job. But Uber in India, it's all commercial, only your yellow plates, right? So your drivers are full-time taxi drivers. That's what Uber in India is. And this is a very interesting, very important point because what constitutes the highest cost of operations for you, it's your taxi drivers because ultimately they are the ones who is bringing in the fleet for you, fleet of vehicles for you, right? So I will leave you with that thought for now. We'll come back to it in the next few slides, but that's one difference. Second, the fleet. In US, primarily it's cars, but when you look at a market like India, you're looking at auto rickshaws, which is a, probably another very common mode of transport, and of course, bikes, etc. And most importantly, payment options. In an economy like US, everything is pretty much digitized even if you look at a 2017 time frame, Whereas in India, still our market is partially digitized. It's like a cash option is, is a mandatory thing for being successful in a market like India. So Uber added cash option. And in addition to that, there are several legal security aspects which comes into picture, uh, which is tuned to the market requirements. For example, women's safety, there is a panic button which was created for the first time globally for Uber in India. And even things like search pricing. I mean, you have controls or regulations on search pricing in India. So it's just to highlight a point that when you are looking for a product to be going global, you have to be thinking of the customizations that you need to do on a geography basis because one size fits all is never, is hardly going to be the case or otherwise you are leaving too much room open for competitors to come. So now you know the market landscape, you know competitors. So you would have gone through different positioning uh, options available for a business. Like, can you be a premium differentiator in this market? Of course, you could say, I want to be providing ride sharing in Rolls Royce, but is that going to meet the goal that you are looking at? Absolutely no. Why? Because you are looking for a large number of user acquisition. And with the Rolls Royce, I'm going to get a few millionaires to join you, but I'm not going to get the mass market. Can you be a cost leader? But for you to be a cost leader, you have to be getting access to the lowest cost resources, which is very important. Otherwise, if your cost of operations is high and you tend to go into the market with a lower price than your Ubers and Olas of the world, 
of course you are not going to be sustainable because they have got the heavy funding they already have established their market and it's not a sustainable move if you just go in as a low price uh, offering can you go for a niche positioning looking at a very small segment of users again that's not enough for you you need you are looking for large volume of users so it's very important how you go about identifying your positioning it can be a niche use case but it cannot be a niche market you have to be looking at a large number of users and most importantly how do you sustain yourself you need to have core advantages or a high um, or an advantage that is not very easy to copy by your formidable competitors like who are out there in the market already who might be able to just take you out as it is so how can you create a high um, barrier for these existing formidable vendors out there while ensuring you can sustain yourself in an identified niche use case so this is at a high level as a pm you will be looking at okay what are my options how could i go down so far clear any any questions i think it should be pretty straightforward okay i don't see any questions so let's proceed so now you know you are looking for something which meets all this criteria Excuse me. I think someone needs to mute. Okay. So now to match with this criteria that you are looking at, you need to know. Okay, is there something in this market which I could be looking at? Is there a customer? Is there a customer need that I could solve, which helps me build a positioning like what I am looking for? so for that obviously as a pm you have to do the needs discovery of your customer you can do different methods you can have a survey you can have focus group discussions you can go and talk to people who are commuting on a daily basis in uber ola etc and that discovery mechanism that you apply would lead you to some very important questions to ask first thing is what is your most consistent commute pattern if i am to look at a business which needs to be high volume or a high number of users to come in of course you have to be looking at their most consistent commute pattern and possibly no surprises there the most commu consistent commute pattern is going to be from home to work and back because that's like if you look at the working population that would be possibly the most consistent pattern that we could be able to draw the other stuffs are all like on a need basis on demand basis but this is fairly consistent now your second question who is willing to offer the rights at the lowest cost structure like can i go and tell an uber driver okay i'm going to build a new business can you come and join me as a driver at uh, one tenth the um income that you could be making with uber of course he may not agree because he is looking for money from that it's his livelihood so who is willing to offer rights at the lowest cost structures of course it's someone who would not be looking to make profits but instead looking to minimize his cost of commute or share his cost of commute as a non commercial uh offering right and probably one who is driving already in the same direction at the same time and someone who has got extra seats in his vehicle and many a times if you are in big cities and if you have a carpool or a hov lane that provides you with the option to avoid the traffic congestion i mean many of the drivers would be very keen to have that as a option they wouldn't mind providing another rider another um person with a ride if it would help them to take the carpool lane especially during the peak hours now on the other side what would a rider value the most with regard to his office commute 
of course he would want to have the comfort of a private vehicle if he can get it at a right fee which is cheaper than the public transport but most importantly when you are thinking about your office you want a capability to pre schedule something for a committed predetermined timing because you cannot be i mean for the last minute you cannot be looking for a on demand ride because you might have a meeting at let's say 9 am and you can't be scrambling around at 8:45 to see okay can i get a uh, cab or or whatever means of commute to get to office right so it's one segment where customers look a lot for a pre scheduled um or a committed timing and this is really what is feeding in to the the use case of the product that we are going to build here and that's what a waste carpool or a quick ride or a scoop has done they are looking at the use case b which we are talking about here that is carpool for work where your driver the relationship between the driver and rider is a non commercial relationship so to say primarily because the money that i as a driver earn when i am driving base carpool is not going to be taxable for me it's a it's a expense sharing it's a reimbursement which is happening or a cost sharing which is happening between the driver and rider so we are looking at a um driver segment which is not the the full time drivers or who are not looking at making money from driving primarily and of course it provides you with a very cost effective consistent uh, commute pattern that is capable of drawing a large number of customers towards you because office commute i mean if you are able to get that pie from an uber or an ola it's a very sizable market to look at and what you want to avoid is to get into the on demand ride business which is all what an uber lyft or ola is providing and of course you know it's on demand random routes random timings and it's primarily a commercial offering where the drivers are looking for a taxable income their livelihood coming out of this process and and you know every each of these vendors offer more cost effective options the ride sharing options like uber pool or uber express pool uh, all our share etc where you can have multiple people going in the same direction and put together each of you are going to have like a lower cost etc so there is going to be some uh, impact of uh, these existing vendors on the market that you are looking for but still if you have got your cost structure your pricing structure right a non commercial offering is going to be having a higher viability than a commercial offering so as a pm who is posed with this problem that you are looking at we are not looking at the on demand ride where these existing players are very strong and formidable but instead we are looking at the key use case of carpool for work and this is how you basically identify who your customer persona is and what your use case is and this is the primary input that you as a pm need to be providing your engineering or delivery teams to work on because if they go down this path of on demand ride you can of course think imagine that the the requirements are going to be very different so with that we come to defining the value proposition of of your offering so what you are going to do is you are going to create an app based platform which would allow a car pooling or a bike pooling to work so it's a very niche use case but it is still having a large volume of users who will be looking for this and this is focused on part time part time drivers who are not looking for making profits and that allows you a cost advantage because you may not need a lot of lot of incentives to uh to be given unlike what our o- ola or uber will need to give to their drivers and primarily for the fact that this is a non commercial offering that is a boon for you that is a blessing which allows to keep your competitors out because there are limits uh for a commercial offering to get into the non commercial space so in a fact that is creating a barrier of entry to make your business sustainable but you know of course uh it's not a not going to be 1 pm who will be looking at this direction there will be multiple of players and that's what 
would have resulted in multiple vendors out there in the market ways carpool scoop quick ride for all focused on a similar value proposition but of course the market which they are focusing today is different quick ride is primarily india ways carpool scoop are in primarily us but yeah we'll see as the days goes how things will evolve but this is just at a high level how you will be defining the value proposition for your offering looking back into your customer needs the market the competitive analysis etc now so now you know what product to build possibly or what is the positioning of your product but how are you going to validate that indeed what you have thought about is a brilliant idea how would you make sure it's not a very stupid idea because sometimes we might be stuck in our own shell that we might think okay it's super brilliant but tomorrow you go out to the market there will be a much cheaper uh, substitute or a uh, um, uh, uh, substitute offering or even the customer might say oh no this is nonsense i don't want to go into it so it's very important for you to validate your idea and that's what brings in the concept of a mvp minimum viable product so as a startup you have two options uh you have got let's say some funding investment you can just go and build a carpooling app like what we discussed earlier and then go to market and then hope you have got everything right that's one option but if something goes wrong you don't have funding or investment to get it right again so typically what the organizations or pms will try to do is to define an mvp a minimum viable product so it should be like the donuts here right provide you with the base vanilla function so that you can see okay will someone be looking for a donut in the market and if if your initial feedback says yes it is what we need then you can make it look really great like the second picture but you test your ideas and the definition of mvp should be such that it takes consumes the least possible resources but at the same time provide you with an ability to validate your idea and why is mvp beneficial one as i mentioned it's saving time and resources for you more importantly it gives you access to a user base and you could possibly find your early adopters whose inputs are going to be very valuable as you build your product because a lot of your roadmap features are going to come in as feedback and also it provides you with a very uh, i mean it provides you with an option to attract investors earlier someone says okay it's a very promising idea they are going to further invest in you and that would make your product more sustainable or your offering more sustainable so the key thing as i mentioned as far as the mvp is concerned is you have to find the least resource consuming method but most importantly you have to validate your riskiest assumptions that you are making what is that most risky assumption that i am making with my whole business model and that's what you should be aiming to solve with an mvp an mvp need not be an always a full fledged app or a whatever it is right it can be even just a mock up depending on what you are looking at what is the value prop that you are looking at for example if you want to have a e-commerce you could just have a website you don't need to be completely closing on all your inventory uh, the supply chain etc you could just take the product from the nearby show uh, sto- um, nearby store and deliver it to a customer you could have bought it at 10 dollar but you are giving it to the customer at 8 dollar with the promise that it's an e-commerce uh, offering which provides much better prices than your stores so you don't have the back end supply chain uh, built in the right fashion but you get the idea is is the market looking for something like an e-commerce offering at a lower price than your typical on, on store offerings so the the definition of mvp it can be anything starting from a mock up to a uh, alpha release depending on what exactly is the product or offering that you are looking at but the key outcome is it should be able to validate your concept your idea and most importantly the riskiest assumptions and from a release perspective usually the mvp stage will be followed by 
a controlled availability or a beta depending on what the different organizations call it where you might have added about 80 to 90 percentage of the fe features it may not be a very hard inversion but you share it with your select friendly customers to gather more inputs and feedback and based on all those feedback you do the bug fixes you add the additional features etc and then you will launch your general availability release which is fully hardened 100 percentage of the features released and of course you are releasing it for all your customers so that's at a high level very high level um how the the process would be evolving starting from mvt to mvp to the general launch of your product so now from the app that you are building what is a riskiest assumption of course the carpool like if you are looking at a scoop or a base pool um, you are making a big assumption that office commuters are willing to take a detour to pick up riders that's a big assumption are they willing to make a detour for sharing the expense and most importantly even if they are how much of detour are they going to take and it's a it's a big function depending on the geography that you're looking at for example if i'm in bay area and i need to pick up a rider who is probably three miles away from me i may not be too concerned yeah i would say okay it's saving me um or it's giving me five dollars why should i uh waste it i will just go and pick him on my way it might take me five minutes to pick him up but the same three miles may not hold good in a city like bangalore right where you have much more traffic congestion even if it is a small detour the incentives may need to be much higher compared to uh what would be in a higher traffic uh, compared to in a um area where you don't have so much of traffic or you have more predictability so all of these are factors we should be going in and for you to be successful one key ingredient is going to be your matching algorithm whom do you match with and if you are giving a matching option to your users where like uh, i'm matching you with another person who is 30 miles away then of course it's worthless the uh, feedback would be okay this is not what we are looking for right so the matching algorithm is a very key ingredient so how would you go about building the mvp requirements for the carpool idea of course you have to create an app which would be running this basic algorithm that we are looking at and you can build an app in multiple flavors like multiple uh, operating systems you can go for an android you can go for an ios so would you want to go for all of them in one shot in your mvp stage absolutely not you might pick one of them and going back to the case study hypothetical case study you are a google pm if that is the case you might say i'm going to go with android which is a google product otherwise and of course if i'm looking for a market which is more india centric definitely i'm going to go for android because i have higher numbers but if i'm going to think about launching something first in us and thinking india is going to be my um, growth plan then possibly i'm going to look for an ios app where i could be having more user, users in us so you you go by your business the market that you are targeting and come up with one os where you would be testing your basic application capability so that's one part of the mvp you are not going for the full pledge then of course you have to build the basic things needed for an app like this creating the profiles collect the driver and the rider information vehicle information you need to have the ability to place request that i want to join as a rider or a driver or either option and most importantly i need to be able to specify which is my pick up point which is my drop point what is the time range in which i am willing to be picked up etc but the crux is the most important piece is how do you suggest optimal matches between the rider and the driver of course it has to be based on the route based on the timing but that is the most important problem like as an engineer that uh, your organization may need to solve because if that piece goes wrong then you don't have a viable offering and you obviously need to make payments you have multiple payment options you can go for credit card debit card all the wallets but 
you may not go with all of them right away. You can just use one of those options. For example, Google Pay as an option. And most importantly, when you are looking at a product like this, you need to have a lot of scale because there is some database requirements, etc., where you are storing all the profile information of your users, etc. Would you like to really build uh, the large scale of um, user and database in the beginning? No, not needed. You can just say for my MVP phase, my scale is limited to 100 users and I'm going to focus on a single major city to get enough feedback. Like I'm going to uh, focus in SFO as a market. So this is how you minimize your resource needs to validate your assumption and you go to a select pool of prospects and validate your idea. So, okay, now assume that you went to, with an MVP, you got all the fantastic feedback. Now, what is next direction? You will be getting a lot of feedback from your customers, prospects, etc., And that's where the role of a PM is very important. You would have got 100 new requirements and your engineering would be wondering, what should I be doing? Which one should I be working on? What is the priority? And that's where the product roadmap comes to the rescue. PM builds the product roadmap. He is the sole owner uh, of the product roadmap. And it's built based on the customer needs, feedback, your business strategy. Like you, It's very important to keep your positioning when you are building your roadmap and prioritizing it. You have to be looking at competitors. All of these factors will come into your roadmap. And typically organizations will have a roadmap identified at least for the next six months, if not for probably something like an 18 or 24 months, depending on the size of the organization, the type of development methodology that they use, et cetera. So some startups might just say, okay, I'm looking only at six months because I'm going to be very agile, I have more flexibility, et cetera. So I'm more agile to the changing market needs. Whereas larger organizations who have a set probably a nine month or a 12 month release cycle might at least need to maintain roadmap for two releases. So you will still see a 18 month or 24 months roadmap, et cetera. But at a high level, it's very important for the PM to keep maintaining his roadmap, uh, understanding every nuances happening in the market. And the roadmap will include most importantly, the PM priorities. It will mention the timelines or the release, which the PM is asking engineering to. And of course, PM will be working with your engineering delivery organizations to make sure uh, the release mappings are made appropriate, subject to the resource availability, et cetera, et cetera. And obviously you are going to have in your roadmap must haves, must have uh, requirements or a P zeros, which should be high business revenue impact or a customer impact. And you might say, okay, the next release is not going to come out without this feature. So if this feature gets delayed, the whole release gets delayed. Whereas you might have some other features which are P1s, good to have. It will have business impact, but possibly you may not want to hold a bigger release back uh, if this feature alone is getting delayed. And then of course you will have a lot of radar items in your roadmap, which you're still thinking, or you want to have a, a sufficient additional business justification to productize or put into the roadmap planning. So, if you are to, I mean, just a sample of how uh, a roadmap could look like. Again, this is not a very uh, fancy format, but just to give you a perspective. I mean, we discussed about many of the MVP needs earlier. So that MVP is gonna be possibly, I mean, always the MVP pieces will most likely be in your controlled availability release. Um, of course, some things may slip out primarily because maybe you got feedback from the customers that, okay, it's not valuable. I'm not looking for it. But there will be still other features that you might add. For example, ability to track the location of the ride on a real-time basis. You may not have done it in the control availability, but you will make it available in the GA release, general availability release, and it's a mandatory have. But there might be features like, as a rider, I want to specifically match with a specific driver or a friend of mine uh, rather than the system auto automatically matching me with another driver. That is probably a good to have. It's not a mandatory feature to go in in my GA. Some customers could be asking for it 
and maybe a lot of customers are asking for it, but it may not be like a make or break factor. So I would have it in my roadmap as a good to have or a P1. Uh, there might be other requirements like I, I want to have the ability to make cash payments or I want to have um, ability to apply cancellation charges if someone cancels a ride uh, after a commitment. So it could be a high priority or it could be a low priority depending on your exact positioning, how you are going to market. So now let's get into that. We discussed about scoop, waste carpool, quick ride, etc. Right? The question is, would the roadmap be similar for all of them? Because they are in the same business, they are in the same carpool uh, segment. But the fact is, if assuming that the scoop and the waste carpool are coming to market at the same time, their roadmap is not going to be identical because it is still decided by the unique selling proposition or the differentiation of that product. So let's try to understand what would be the differentiation strategy for scoop. Okay, so what is most interesting with scoop here? Can, uh, from what you have seen, can you suggest like, what do you see as special with regard to scoop? from what you have seen here already. Exactly, auto match. So the scoop is getting the requirements from uh, riders and drivers, depending on the timeline, and they are doing an auto match. So it's not that Google is asking very specifically for a specific driver or a rider. Instead, depending on all the requests coming in, they are doing a auto match in the system itself and provides or shares the information between the rider and the driver. And at the time of that match is made, you don't know who that uh, fellow rider is going to be, how far is he going to be from you. So it's, it's more like your arranged marriage, right? So it's something like that. The, ma uh, the match is made in heaven. And in this case, the heaven is the the auto algorithm of uh, uh, scoop. And another important fact, as you would have seen, you are expected to make your uh, request in before a specific uh, time interval or a specific slot within the day. For example, if you are requesting for a morning ride, you need to be placing your request before 9 p.m. the last night. Or if you are making or trying for an evening ride, you need to place a request before 3 p.m. in the evening. So it's, it's like a very stringent, stringent timeline that Scoop is providing uh, within which you will be able to enter in. So this is very uh, one very important piece to uh, think about Scoop. And another key factor, I mean, of course, I couldn't show you the whole video, but you need to keep in mind is it talks about uh, a committed and guaranteed carpool ride. That's what the USP for Scoop is. It does not give you a lot of flexibility to choose whom you want to go with, etc. But commitment is very important. That's the reason why you have a specific time before which you have to place your request. And of course, Scoop charges you uh, if you cancel after a commitment is made. And even it provides you with a guaranteed home ride program which says if for some reason you come to office in scope and on the return ride you are not able to find, it will compensate you for a um, carpool ride that you might take in a Uber or a public transport, etc. So its whole value prop is around committed and guaranteed carpool rides. Now coming to base, see how it is different here. Drivers, here's how you offer a ride to a fellow carpooler. First, open the Waze app and tap the carpool button in the bottom right corner. On the main screen, you'll see your upcoming drives for the week. Want a carpool to work tomorrow? Just scroll through the list of riders on your route. Tap a profile to learn more about the rider and see details like the pickup time, 
how much you'll get for the ride, and a map of the pickup and drop-off spots. If everything looks good, tap to continue. Now you can review the details and add a personal message. Looks good, tap set. Okay, so does this look like a match that you are having more control over? So like a love marriage, right? So that is exactly how uh, Waze Carpool is positioning itself. So you are getting to see who are the different rider options or driver options you have got, who he is, where she or he is working, uh, what sort of um, uh, vehicle is he using. Uh, you could see the ratings of uh, the person. And most importantly, you know how much is the detour you are making before you could go for a match. So it gives more control in the hands of the driver or the rider. And especially the control for driver is very important because if he feels that, okay, I'm going to be matched with someone who is 10 miles away and I don't want to take the pain of going that much, he might just opt out of the system. So having control for the driver in that respect is very important. And that's what the USP for base car pullers, it provides you with the maximum flexibility and choice. So now keeping that, I mean, just a high level positioning overview, as we mentioned, ability to choose a match yourself, Scoop does not provide that, whereas Waze provides. But Waze Carpool does not have any daily schedule, scheduling window restriction. Like it's 5 p.m., you just find that your work is over, you want to start early, uh, unlike your usual 6.30 p.m. slot, you can just place a request and if there is someone available, you can get a carpool at that point of time. So it's very tuned for people who do not have a lot of control over their work timings. I mean, you cannot get, you, it's not guaranteed that you can get a carpool, but you can place a request at any point of time. And if there is a match at that point of time, you are going to get matched. For the same reason, they don't, they don't charge a cancellation charge. If you say, okay, I committed to something, but I'm stuck in my work. I cannot come out now. You can cancel it. There is no car, uh, cancellation charges. And there is no door-to-door -door service. Typically, there is a predetermined pickup drop point for the convenience of the driver. Um, so it's not necessarily a door-to-door -door service, even though people might, some drivers might do that. Uh, and there is no guaranteed home ride program. So you see the, the positioning of these two products, even though they are in the same carpool business, is very different. And when you are building a roadmap, some features would be prioritized accordingly. For example, if Scoop gets a request that, okay, I need the ability to match with a specific driver or rider of choice. That's not going to be like a P0 for them. It's something which they would be still looking at primarily because their user would have said, I like this feature a lot and I get this in base carpool. So I want you to add it. So a PM would be still very serious about it because, um, Otherwise, you might be losing your customers to the competitor, in this case, the waste car pool. But still, is it going to be a GA feature? Maybe not. But they may not entertain if someone comes and asks, okay, I want all the maximum match recommendations for my ride. They might say, okay, no, we don't do that. Our way is to provide you with an auto match and our app is built in that way. It's not a high priority item. I will just keep this in mind. And if I see the whole market is heading that direction, I'm losing more and more customers for not having it, I will consider it. But at this point of time, it's a radar item for me. Whereas, like ability to apply cancellation charges. If someone is coming to Waze Carpool and says, okay, uh, my driver dished me, uh, can you start applying a cancellation charges for committed rights? They might say, boss, no, that's not what we want to do because our USP is to provide maximum flexibility and we understand sometimes the schedule changes may be needed to get that flexibility. So they may not apply a cancellation charge. So they may not put this in the roadmap uh, because it's not aligning with their positioning. Now, there might be additional things. Would you want to have a cash payments or would you want to provide a location-based ads? Just hold on to that thoughts. There is again going to be a difference which we will discuss in the next slide. Scoop may not see a lot of value for a cash payment or a location-based ads, but Car, waste carpool might and you know why let's get into the pricing so how you will typically price your product of course you need to know the distance of the travel the local gas cost the local public transportation cost and maybe even regulatory restrictions for example in us 
uh, IRS says there is a standard for vehicle mileage reimbursement, which is 54 cents per mile. So your rides could be priced accordingly because you, you need some sort of a benchmark when you are pricing it. And this is the price which the rider will need to be paying for the ride. But how does these apps make money? That's again very interesting. Scoop, it's very straightforward. The rider might pay about $2 to $10, depending on the distance to the driver, from which Scoop is going to deduct $1 per rider per trip. So very standard. Cook ride is something similar, about a 6% commission they take on the fare. Whereas Waze Carpool is different. They do not charge a commission. And why? One benefit is they are part of Google family. Waze is an acquisition of Google. And Google has the, the you know, capability to provide you with a location-based ads. So Waze Carpool can always use a location-based ads revenue to come in while not deducting it from the driver. And this gives them an option to even provide a cash payment because the rider could be giving cash to the uh, driver and Waze Carpool does not care because they are not getting anything from that. So it can provide them with a cash payment option especially for markets like some emerging markets if they want to get into. So this is an interesting area that that's a reason uh, like Waze Carpool might be considering these two features in their roadmap, depending on sufficient business justification, but probably for Scoop, it may not be a lot of value add because they have to get, uh, I mean, it, it, there is no core competence for them there because if the cash payment is involved, then how was Uber, uh, Scoop going to get its payment, right? It's, it becomes a little more tricky. And the next piece is identifying the route to market. So of course you need to have, uh, you can directly reach out to the office commuters like you and me, but you can also reach through your employers. You can go and get some funding from your employers, or you can ask your employers to subsidize the carpool rights of your employees. So this could come in as a employee incentive scheme, which is much more attractive than a public transport um, incentive. The, employers could be providing to their employees. There are also counties, government agencies who would be providing subsidies to reduce the traffic congestion, pollution, etc. So I've just captured some um, ads and things here, which is around the incentives which counties provide, what uh, an employer could provide for their employees by adopting scoop for their employees or their uh, or the people in the county. And of course, when you're launching a product, you will need to ensure there's a pickup in the adoption rate. And you will always have promotional offerings to make sure you get the required adoption and you can also tweak the pricing, tweak the pricing depending on the right price point because you might still be figuring it out in the beginning. So for example, Waze Carpool provides a $20 referral reward uh, when you refer someone to it. And uh, the person who is newly joining, they might be getting a $20 bonus. So things like that, which incentivize people to join a uh, waste carpool or a scoop. And one last thing which I wanted to say is your strategy, your positioning is never static. You have to always keep the fact in that there will be competitive reactions. There will be uh, market updates happening and you have to iteratively take that into your strategy. So in this case, think from an Uber perspective, what will Uber do when they see this uh, waste carpool coming in and taking a lot of their market uh, in terms of like their most consistent commute pattern is now possibly going to the these carpool vendors, right? So if you look at it, they are going to come up and say, okay, I, I will add an express pool, which is much cheaper than the pool option, which is much cheaper than the UberX option where you ride along, right? So from a price point perspective, they are going to bring it down. But there is a caveat. In any ride, Uber charges their drivers typically like 25 percentage of their fees and also there is a booking fee which is like a flat fee that goes to uber so if tomorrow uber says this ride which was otherwise ten dollar is now seven dollars the person who hit, takes the hit the most is going to be that driver so when your ride fee is lower your drivers are becoming less happy so it's not very sustainable for these vendors to offer rides at a lower and lower pricing so they will have to be looking at alternate options, how to uh, make sure they are able to grow. So it could be like going to new markets or like what Uber did, they would be thinking more strategically. They could evolve from an everyone's private driver, 
motto to connecting you with the people places things you love so you have uber eats which is like going very good right so you are trending yourself or evolving yourself strategically from your business strategy perspective not just limiting yourself to be a car ride uh, option but also connecting you with everything that you love so uber eats uber freight uber health jump bikes rental etc so these are like different directions in which the vendors react that they are in the market to the different competitive actions or even the market landscape in general so i think with that we come to the key takeaways we pretty much discussed all of these aspects as to what you need to keep in mind or how your thought process need to be when you are uh, going through each of these steps and this is again a very as i mentioned not a exhaustive list of things but ge- just a general thinking direction for you which will help you in making the right decisions thanks so much kokul it Thank uh, you, Sharika. was really an uh, you know engaging session where uh, all of us loved listening to you and uh, you know it was uh, a great insight uh, i'm sure everyone else also would have uh, you know the same kind of feedback thanks so much thank you thank you all and feel free to connect with me in linkedin um absolutely uh, would be very happy to share in whatever ways i can to help you all in your journeys as well thank you thanks all